Starting on Christmas Eve, a crime spree took place in Dayton, Ohio that ended up with six people losing their lives and several others getting heavily injured. A horrific crime committed by a group of teenagers that became known simply as the Christmas Killings. This story focuses on a band of teenagers who were known for seeking out trouble. They were a dirt-broke group of kids who had become estranged from their families. They had begun calling themselves the Downtown Posse. They spent most of their days bumming for money at the Courthouse Square downtown. The leader of the group was a huge, intimidating 19-year-old man named Marvalis Keen. However, despite his demeanor, he had actually never been arrested and was known to be a good student until his older brother was killed during a robbery in 1991, that is. This affected him deeply, changing who he was as a person. He became depressed, gave up on school, and took on a dark change in his personality. The second in command, the effectively intellectual leader of the group, was his 16-year-old girlfriend, Laura Taylor. Taylor was known for being extremely tough, often hard on the others but little did they know what she truly was capable of. Also present in the group was Demarcus Smith, who was 17, and his girlfriend Heather Matthews, who was 20. The group had collectively grown a little bit bored of bumming for cash and had decided to aim for something bigger. Something much bigger. It was the morning of Christmas Eve in 1992, not the usual time for dark dealings. But despite this, Laura Taylor wasn't feeling so cheerful. Her boredom was getting to her. She began to hassle the other members of the group, pressuring them into doing something heinous. Let's get some drama in our lives, she told them. Starting off pretty big, they decided to plan a robbery. It wasn't long before they decided on a victim, 34-year-old Joseph Wilkerson, an acquaintance of Taylor's. They were going to trick him into inviting Taylor and Matthews into his home by promising he would get to have a fun, naked time with the two girls. They went to his home and were let inside. The two girls pretended to undress in order to get Wilkerson to let his guard down. Shortly after, they pulled a gun and pointed it at him, ordering him to lie on the bed where they tied him up. Bound to the headboard by electrical cords, the two girls, along with Keen, began searching the house for valuables and ransacking it. In the garage, Keen found a 32 caliber Derringer pistol. He, likely desiring to eliminate the witness, returned to the bedroom with the pistol and shot Wilkerson in the chest. Taylor then took the gun from him, put the gun to Wilkerson's head herself, and pulled the trigger. The amount of treasure they got from ransacking the entire house didn't really amount to much. They took a microwave, a small cheap TV, a phone, a curling iron, and a blow dryer. The only thing they ended up taking of much value was Wilkerson's car, and with it, they would take to the town and hunt for more victims. Not only did this vehicle become a great asset for them, but they would continue using Wilkerson's house as a sort of base of operations. They would party in his house for the next several days as he lay dead in his bed, covered by nothing but a pile of clothes and junk. Heading out, they ended up on 517 Neal Avenue. They spotted a woman talking on a payphone, 18-year-old Danita Gallette. Little did she know she was about to become their second victim. Noticing that she had a nice coat and a good pair of shoes, she became an easy target for a quick robbery. Keen came up to the phone booth and said, Merry Christmas, bitch, pointing a gun at the glass. As she begged for her life, Keen fired a volley of nine bullets into the booth. She was a senior at Patterson Cooperative High School, the mother of a two-year-old. This young mother was killed for a pair of tennis shoes, a coat, and a backpack that contained a bounty of exactly 50 cents. Her body was found later by the police, lying on the ground outside the telephone booth, having been shot by five of the nine bullets that were fired. The pavement was covered with blood and shell casings, the latter of which would prove very significant in the long run. The group would later return together to an apartment that Keen owned, one that they would often all stay at, an apartment at 157 Yuma Place. 
They all planned to crash there for the night, but not before they attempted to take yet another victim, Heather Matthews' ex-boyfriend, Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey was also there at the apartment, hanging out with the rest of the group that night. After a confrontation, Smith ended up firing off four shots into his legs. Strangely though, he survived the attack. He ended up escaping, running off to a neighbor's house, which is nothing short of a miracle when you have four bullets in your legs. That night, two other friends were at the apartment. Wendy Cottrell, age 16, and Marvin Washington, age 18. They witnessed the attack on Jeffrey. Keen, Taylor, Smith, and Matthews began questioning if the other two could keep quiet about the whole ordeal. They began worrying that they would implicate them in not only this attack, but also the other two murders they had committed. However, they decided to sleep on it. For now. The next morning, on Christmas Day, the gang started plotting their next robbery. They decided that the next target would be Richard Maddox, age 19, who was Taylor's ex-boyfriend. She convinced him to go to a hotel with her where, unbeknownst to him, the whole group would ambush him and rob him. Maddox left his parents' home and went to pick up Taylor, where they both left together in his car. Keen, Smith, and Matthews followed them from behind in their own vehicle. However, things quickly went wrong. They weren't very good at hiding the fact that they were following Maddox's car. He quickly caught on and slammed his foot onto the accelerator to escape. Taylor, in a rage-fueled panic, pulled a gun and put it to his right temple. She fired, killing him while he was still driving. Quickly realizing the implications of this, she successfully bailed out from the car while it was still moving. The car went on to crash on Benton Avenue. His body was found, and it was clear that he had died from a gunshot while still operating the vehicle. The four then spent Christmas night lurking around an ATM on Salem Avenue. They were hoping to kill and rob the next person to use it, but thankfully that just never happened. They all pulled over into a parking lot and parked. They decided that they could get some rest in Wilkerson's car. Despite one of their victims escaping, their suspicions of their friends and their failed robbery, the group slept the night away, ready for the next big day. The next morning came. It was now the 26th. The gang went over to a gas station and spotted a woman airing up the tires on her Dodge Shadow. They decided it would be nice to have another stolen car on them and ordered her to hand it over at gunpoint. The woman easily could have become their next victim, but she ran away instead of freezing in place as they demanded. She later reported the car stolen. The gang would end up switching the license plates between the vehicles in an attempt to confuse and throw off the police. They all ended up at a shortstop mini market on West 5th Street, a small family-owned grocery store. Taylor walked inside alone, scoping out the place as a potential new robbery spot. Behind the counter was Sarah Abraham, a young mother of three. She had just received a hand-drawn picture from her daughter for Christmas just that morning before having to head into work. Keen and Smith came strolling in when Keen abruptly shot Abraham twice in the head, leaving behind identical shell casings to those found outside the phone booth earlier on. They turned around and shot a customer named Jones Pettis. They fired more shots at another customer, 71-year-old Jimmy Thompson, and missed. Thompson was able to escape death and injury by pretending to have been hit and falling to the floor. Ironically, just before, he had given the, quote, innocent-looking Laura Taylor a nickel to help her buy a drink when she was short on change. Jones Pettis luckily survived his injuries that day, but Sarah Abraham wasn't near as lucky. She was in the hospital for five days, but ultimately passed away there. The gang ended up with a whopping... $44 profit from this venture. After the robbery at the grocery store, the group remembered their doubts from the previous night about Cottrell and Washington. They ended up asking the two to hang out, bringing some beer and wine. They drove around for a while until Keen said that he needed to pee. They pulled off into a gravel yard on Richley Drive. The two new victims quickly realized something was up when Keen and Smith ordered them out of the car. In shock, Cottrell didn't move, so Keen ripped her out of the car by her hair. The two were ordered to walk over behind a large pile of dirt. They frantically promised that they hadn't snitched, 
but it didn't matter. Their fate was sealed. While Katra was pleading for her life, Keen put his gun into her mouth and fired. At the same time, Smith executed Washington at close range. The two former friends became the fifth and sixth victims of the spree. They took some gold chains along with Cottrell's shoes before dumping the bodies elsewhere. A short time later on Cumbler Avenue, about 72 hours after the first killing took place, a Dayton police sergeant named John Huber ended up spotting a vehicle that seemed suspicious to him, the Dodge Shadow that had been stolen earlier. He called in a check on the plates, and it came back that those plates weren't even registered to that car. His suspicions validated, he had units close in on the car from all sides. He pulled over the thieves, thinking he was only arresting someone for Grand Theft Auto, but soon found all of the guns in the vehicle. After all of the previous violent fanfare, the actual arrest and capture was pretty uneventful. In the beginning, Taylor ordered Keen to shoot at the police, but he chose not to and gave up peacefully. In turn, so did Taylor and Matthews. They all cooperated, raising their hands as they were told. Smith, on the other hand, decided to take off on foot to a nearby house, but was soon captured. Police were completely unaware that they had just ended one of the worst crime sprees in Dayton's entire history. At the time, police still hadn't found a link between all of the murders occurring in the city, but they definitely stood out as something unusual. The city regularly had fewer than one murder a week, but now they saw three, that they knew of, occur within the span of just a few days, at Christmas of all times. The first thing that connected the crimes was the identical shell casings found at two of the sites. Happening twice in two days, the police naturally began to fear that whoever was doing this was going to keep doing it. However, given the random nature of the crimes and the killer being unconnected to the victims, it was proving very difficult to put together. During interrogations, Taylor was described as the most hardened person the police had ever seen, despite being only 16 years old. She was extremely cold and remorseless. She even urinated in her interview room chair instead of asking to use the bathroom, presumably just to spite them. The others more or less cooperated. Eventually, after everyone was interviewed, the police were able to put the puzzle pieces together and figure out what really happened over the previous days. Joseph Wilkerson was found at his home that evening. The four members of the gang were put behind bars. That night, Taylor got a visit from a local minister. He had been concerned that someone so young could commit such horrible crimes. He only wished to talk to her. During their conversation, she plainly told him about two other victims that the police hadn't found the two supposed traitors, Washington and Cottrell. The next day, on the 27th, the police received an anonymous tip, fairly likely from the minister, that led them to find the bodies of the two at the city-owned gravel dump. They were just killing people randomly for nothing. Literally nothing. There was not even a motive in these cases. It was just for fun, said Doyle Burke, who had been a homicide detective that worked on the case. Once they tasted blood, they just couldn't stop said Dayton Police Sergeant George Hammond. They were all charged with a slew of felonies, including capital murder, of course. Their trials began. As they were considered juveniles under the law, both Taylor and Smith were immune to the death penalty. Matthews ended up taking a deal with the police, if prosecutors would agree not to seek execution against her. After Keene was arrested, he sent a letter expressing his remorse to a church that he had attended when he was younger, and his defense attorneys argued that a large factor in the crimes was a form of PTSD that he had suffered when his brother was killed. Keene was not spared with any lenience, however, and was given the death sentence for his crimes. The judges concluded that his level of PTSD absolutely did not outweigh the weight of his misdeeds. Keene was convicted in five of the killings. After 17 years' worth of repeated appeals, he was executed by lethal injection on July 21st in 2009 at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville. He refused to give any last words. Journalists took photos of the spectacle from the outside. Almost 30 years later, the entire group is still in prison, aside from Keene. They're now in their 40s, and parole seems very unlikely. Taylor and Matthews are still serving life sentences for murder at the Ohio Reformatory for Women in Marysville. 
Smith is serving out his life sentence at the Mansfield Correction Institute. Heather Matthews blames her role in the killings mostly on peer pressure. She was present during the killings, but never actually fired a weapon herself. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to do what they was doing. DeMarcus Smith was responsible for firing shots during two of the murders, while Laura Taylor was responsible for pulling the trigger during three of the six murders. Two books were written about the case by two of the officers who worked in connection to it. They were both released in the late 2000s. The crime remains as a dark, putrid spot on Dayton, Ohio's history to this day. It's unlikely that it'll be forgotten anytime soon, especially given that three of the four killers are still alive, albeit behind bars. At least we know one of them won't be hurting anyone anymore. Thank you again to everyone who watched and enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, uh, leave it a like if you want to. That's always good. If you like dark content like this, be sure to subscribe. I make things like this a lot. Most, mostly every week. And if you really want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon account, which I have linked in the description below. And speaking of which, shout out to my top patrons. Callahan, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Whittacott, Murray Joel Sanchez, David McLaughlin, Marsh, Buffazerk, Lon Roll, Jewel Mav Chan, Lori Tayaba, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Maine, Jackie, and Teresa Ferguson. You guys are gooder than good. I'm running out of things to say right at, at this spot in the video. Thank you, though. Hello, goodbye.